Okay, so tomorrow I will see all of you after dark. And we will be talking about midterm 2024. And I'm getting a lot of questions about uh, midterm 2023. I'm choosing a, a couple problems that kind of are relevant because today is the last day we talk about kinematics with rigid bodies. Uh, tomorrow I will be starting the uh, kinetics and we will do, I think it's about 10, 10, 12 lectures and then we finally wrap up with vibration. So again, we're doing the same thing as what we've done before, but now we're dealing with geometries. This question was kind of interesting um, and it's really important to understand some of the ideas and to also understand the other thing is that this midterm shifts. And so we are able to cover different material at different times of the year. And that different material, that different material is going to affect what we ask you on that midterm. So acceleration will appear on certain midterms and it will not appear on others. So here we had a triangular plate attached to two supports. Those supports were pinned at points A and B, and link BD and OA connect up the triangle that is defined by A, B, and E. You're given at the very beginning of the problem that you have a rotation that it's occurring, and it's two rads per second. And you're asked to solve for a whole bunch of stuff. Now, at this point, you kind of know that I'm not a big fan of uh, graphical solutions, but you do have the option of a graphical solution because it depends on what you prefer to do. But the first thing you do when you start to solve a problem with graphics is look at what the individual links are doing. So in the end, this is what it's going to look like. I know that at this point, B is a common point both on the link DB and a common point on the link AO. Okay, our A is a common point on the link OA and ABE, and B is a common point on link DB and BEC, or ABEA. The, length, the lengths here, 0.5 meters, you can figure it all out. Three, four, five, everything is given to you. Uh, okay, let's go. You can do this with absolutely no idea how things are working. So again, one of the things that comes across in these discussions is how do you know this is doing this or where everything is sort of doing? A and B are moving in these directions. I don't know if a priori, I don't know in advance whether it's moving up or down, I just know it's going to be moving vertically at point B and horizontally at point A. So I can put those two points onto my triangle. Now the other thing that I know from this triangle is that it's rotating at two rads per second. So the first thing I do is that if I remember my instantaneous centers of zero velocity, this point just happens to coincide with the point C. But it is not on the link anywhere. It's not on the link AB or AO or BD. So it's important to understand C just happens to be coincident. And so I'm using that as a coincident point and I also know that because this thing is rotating with a known angular velocity, which is omega ABE, that those are the directions of the velocities. So if I'm using instantaneous centers, it's really a cool way to quickly get all of this and I, I don't have to worry too much about it. The other thing that I could do, and I would do any time of the day, is say, well, VA equals VB plus VA relative to B, VB plus omega ABE cross with RA with respect to B. So if everything is with respect to B, 
I have velocity of A, which I know is constrained to move in the I direction. I have velocity of B, which is constrained to move in the J direction. And I only have this left. Let me get ABE, which is given to me. Counterclockwise, it's positive. And I also have B to A. So minus I plus J. So minus RABX plus RABY. So again, lots of different ways of doing things. We're not testing you on instantaneous sensors. However, you can use them. You should use them if they help you. So something simple like a motion where you have two things that are perpendicular to each other and you can see it, and it's an easy geometry, go, you go ahead. So C could get this ITV, okay. Anyway, that's, that was a quick one to sort of solve it really easily. But then the question came up, well, if I know the angular velocity already for point B, don't I know the angular velocity for point B everywhere? Well, it only applies to the particular rigid body that I'm looking at. And so I know velocity of B and velocity of A, I know the linear velocity. The linear velocities at the points of interest are the ones that are on the triangle. So I know VA and I know VB, and I know the distances. VB is 0.5 meters away from its center of rotation, and A is 0.6 meters away from its center of rotation. The link VB and OA are fixed point rotations with a fixed point at O and D. But why bother? If you do it this way, you already can calculate everything that you need for your terms. So Now, of course, I, I kind of, I'm just looking at my things right away, but I can get all of this pretty easily. And I can get it because I can look at the diagram. So if I look at omega BD, I know that it's going to be omega BD cross with its distance to the fixed point rotation. So that's 0 0.5, and from D, it's a positive x. So I end up with 0.5. Now, for the second part, I have omega BE, which is given as 2 rads per second, uh, RAB, which is minus 0.3 from B to C, and then up 0.4 in order to complete that triangle. So I get negative 0.3, positive 0.4, and 0. And finally, omega AD, which is VA, 
0, 0, omega AD, 0, 0.6 meters, and 0. So 0, O is the point of rotation. 0.4 to 0.2 is the distance from A to O. The tricky part, maybe the bit that was uh, missed most in the exam, was not necessarily this, but to sort of assume 0.4 meters was the distance and 0.3 meters was the distance. Look carefully at the drawing. Draw the drawing. Make sure you have everything down, so you have everything complete. You have two unknowns and two equations. You have the i and j equation that will result from this. And you end up with omega ed, 1.2 k rads per second, omega ao, 1.33 k rads per second. And you should be pretty confident in that, because if I go back to this drawing and I say, ah, that tells me that I have a counterclockwise rotation here and a counterclockwise rotation here. That makes sense. That's what I expect. And so going back to the drawing is a second step. Don't do the math and assume you got all the terms right, because you probably won't. On your first go, you always make a mistake. And the mistake that typically happens is here, on these terms. The other mistake is to multiply and not do cross multiplication. So be very careful as you're going through these problems that you are confident as to what you're solving and how you're solving. Any questions on this? Omega DE equals, do you, I, I can't hear you, please speak up. A, B. There's no A, B. A, B, E. Omega A, B, E is the angular rotation of the triangular element. The link at the end, B, D, has an angular rotation or speed of 1.2 rads per second. A, O has an angular speed of 1.33 rads per second. Nothing equals anything else. But when you look at a rigid body, A, B, E, any point on that rigid body has the same angular velocity, which is why I can do the little game I did with instantaneous centers back here. Because that has nothing to do with, oh god, I can't remember, O, A, and D, B. This is only for that, it's an arbitrary, non-physical point that happens to coincide with C. You'll see a lot of problems where you have a corner, and a corner that just happens to be really good at describing where the rotation's occurring. So most typical case is something like this, where you have something going down, like this, and you have C. Now, the other one you could have in the same sort of case is something like this, where I apply a force and I don't let the rod fall, but I move it up. And again, C's over there. So as you're looking at these problems, as you're solving these problems, this is, again, just the standard, there are tools or techniques you can use in these problems, but you have to be aware of drawing out what you have. Does that answer your question? Okay. No, so for example, we, we did a number of cases early on when we did the instantaneous centers but say, for example, I have two obje an object with a rigid body that's doing something like this. I have a velocity and an arbitrary point in space. And I have this, for example. So that's one rigid body. That's A. That's B. 
So in order to find its instantaneous center, and this is where it's not worth doing the effort, the instantaneous center is right there. I'll call it an IC so I avoid a mistake. But the entire object is now rotating about that point at that instant. And that omega is true no matter how I reset the problem. So if I then calculate velocity of A with velocity B, I should get the same omega that I just calculate, or well, I sort of visualize that. A, B instead of, oh, so it, you can do whatever you want to. So for example, here, I actually did that. So if I'm looking at A, B, or sorry, I'm looking at velocity A, I've got velocity B, I know omega of A, B, E. In this problem, I took advantage of one thing. I knew that point B is rotating about D, point A is rotating about A, and so when I wrote it, I did not write it as V sub B and V sub A. I wrote it as omega BD crossed with DB, omega A to B, AD, oh, AO, that's an AO. Um, crossed with OA. And I used that information because you always look for something simple. You don't try and describe things in terms of general plane motion. You describe things in terms of fixed uh, point rotation, and from there, extract out the point that you're interested in. So the point has to be fixed, and yeah. it's continuous. Yeah, you can do it with translation. Remember that we've already done, so I did a case last week. Oh. Uh, Week eight, week seven. Where did I slip? Sliding rod. Sliding rotation. I gotta remember. Oh, this one. This one I did. Uh, oh. Uh, maybe I just stuck it in here. Yeah, this one. This is a good one. So here, point A is a fixed point rotation. Point B is what I'm interested in, find VC. And I know C is constrained to move in the I direction. I don't know anything about C other than the fact that it is not rotating and it's translating in I. I don't even know what direction at the beginning of the problem. I kind of could guess, but it, it's not worthwhile. So I took VC equals VB plus VC relative to B. And I think <coughs> I'm going to focus on this part here. Same thing. VC I already know because I already have, uh, oh, VC I already know because I know it's constrained to move an I. VB, I know because it's rotating about point A. So A cos theta, A sine theta. I don't know omega BC, and I don't know VC. I don't know the magnitude. I know the directions. So knowing directions in a translating problem allow me, allows me to set up that solution. And I'm doing this on one rigid body, the link BC. But I'm using the fact that a pinpoint translates a uh, uh, or gives me a translation velocity, a linear velocity at that same point. So velocity C is the same on both. Velocity B is the same on both. But velocity B is a lot easier to calculate on the link AB. And velocity C, I can do whatever I want. But basically, I know that it's translating. I don't want to try and describe it in terms of the link BC. And then the final bit, my unknown with omega BC, I already know it's in K. Fun, fun. Anything more?
Okay, so one of the things that comes across, I hope is coming across, is that you have a lot of different choices, but this is the way to solve all of them. If you've got a velocity problem, I'd solve it as a vector and make sure that I drew out every part of that diagram. Once you draw it out and you can do minus and plus, things become a lot easier and it's, it's a lot more tenable. These problems are very confusing because if you look at this motion right here, good luck. You can't intuit it. I can't intuit it. It may sort of, you know, it may be at a point where it's going to move to the right, maybe at a point it moves to the left. I don't know at the very beginning. But I know that the geometry is constraining it. And because I know the geometry is constraining it, I can calculate everything on it. Same thing with this one. This one's not so hard. But one, you have to accept the fact that C for the link ABE is not a physical point and has nothing to do with a crossover point between BD and AO. And that's one thing that really seems to be coming out in Piazza. That has been. Everybody's sort of saying, well, BC is rotating at this and BD must rotate. No. C is not the, on the same rigid body as the link BD is. So if we're looking at AEC or AEB, we're not looking at BD. So really, really crucial. Any other questions on this one? Um, Let's look at another one of these. I keep getting questions on these on Piazza. I think it's worth sort of looking at them again. And this one was kind of interesting because it's a standard problem. Go ahead. Yeah? Which one? E relative to B. Oh, I know A, A B E, omega A B E. That's given to me in the problem. It's given as positive 2 rads per second. So if I know that, I know it's counterclockwise. If I know it's counterclockwise, then all I have to do is to do the cross multiplication of omega, which I'm given. That's a given value cross with the distance R A B with A with respect to B. So that's minus X plus Y. Oh, for the point E, then I, once I do, do this, I do exactly the same thing. Velocity of E is equal to the velocity of B plus omega A B E cross with R E with respect to B. And it's a good exercise. I do it in the video. I'm not doing it here because I'm just lazy. Um, but REB is just going to be positive x, positive y. Because to go to point E here, that's my triangle. And they're both positive. And one thing you should try is to do that. Not necessarily, because in the cross multiplication, what will happen? You'll end up with a negative term. Yeah. And the other way you can do it, which is not worthwhile, this is not worthwhile doing at all, other than the fact that you can sort of visualize it. Once I know what the instantaneous center is, I know what the whole body is rotating about. And so if I do that, and I have uh, what's the directions? Up, down, then it has to go up and to the right, or left. So that's my direction for velocity e. So I can, I can visualize it right away. I will not calculate it. I will not do the geometry because it drives me crazy to do this kind of geometry, and it's too much work for what it is. For the amount of effort that I can put into the vector solution and look at that, I will do that every day. And so a lot of the solutions, 
including the solution to the midterm 2020, which I just updated two days ago. I went back and I did it as vectors, not as was recommended originally. So that was a secondary reason. Okay. Now this is a standard problem also. And it's interesting for one reason. So I have here two arms. Both arms are vertical. And they are the length DB and OA, uh, 60 millimeters, 240 millimeters. And I have been given plane motion uh, is controlled by a crank OA, length DB for the instant represented. This is 2022, by the way. OA and DB are vertical. OA has a clockwise uh, angular velocity of 3 rads per second and a counterclockwise angular acceleration of 10 rads per second. The velocity of B at this instant, angular velocity, all the rest of the stuff. Okay. So one of the interesting things about this is, again, this is one of those use cases for an instantaneous sensor. And you use it for one reason, so that you can immediately see a property. You do not use instantaneous center when you have some sort of geometry where you have to figure out an angle that is not 90 degrees. If it's not 90 degrees, you can use laws of sines and cosines and you can do whatever you want to. I don't. I hate it. But if you just drop those two normals, you'll notice that they can't intersect. So what does that tell you right away? It tells you that the ABC triangle is translated. There is no rotation of that object. Now you can do it a number of different ways to prove that to yourself. And this is again a case where, hey, I don't have the intuition at this point and I'm really uncomfortable with the way you just sort of drew these vertical lines and said, hey, it's, it's translating. Why don't we just do it the way we would normally do it, which is to say that VB equals VA plus VB relative to A. So same thing as before. It's two different cases, or two, uh, same result is going to happen. So I know omega ABC is zero, by the way, so, but I don't want to use that just yet. I'm going to leave it as an unknown. Now I know that I have fixed point rotation at D and O. And if I know I have fixed point rotation at D and O, then the object is sort of going to the right. And well, I mean, it's, I know it's going to go to the right, but you really want to be careful. I already know what, which length would I know? Uh, OA. I know OA. And that has a clockwise angular velocity. So I really only know that one. I'm sort of taking a leap and assuming that B is going to move to the right as well and be horizontal, that I know for sure. So I can do that. Uh, so I have VB equals VAI plus omega ABC, which I, I know but I don't know, and uh, RBA. X, R, B, A, Y, and everything's with respect to that. So this is negative, zero, clunk. Everything works out. So the important thing is to know the geometry and to draw everything out so that I have a clear idea of what I'm looking at. So I have all the terms there. I have V, A, V, uh, V, B, V, A, and I am going to end up out of this with one term in J. So VBI equals VAI minus 180 millimeters when I do the geometry, omega ABCI. And zero equals minus 240 millimeters, omega ABCJ. Okay, 
Both of those are same. Those are the two equations that result: top and bottom, one for i, one for j. And I can see immediately that 240 millimeters does not equal zero. So the only way this is correct is, is if this is zero. So if that's zero, then on the next line it's zero too. So it tells me that VB equals VA. So the linear velocities of both of those points on the translating object are going to be the same. Now, again, no intuition there. That one kind of intuitive. I kind of looked at it and kind of knew what it was. But omega ABC is zero. After that, I can solve through for everything. And VB equals VA, which equals OA dot times omega OA, which equals 0 0.18 meters per second. Now, again, I have to be very careful. The velocity of B equals the velocity of A, but that does not mean my angular velocities are the same. They obviously cannot be, because there's a radial dependence on or linear velocity. So DB is much longer than DAE, AO. And so omega DB is equal to VB divided by db, which equals 0 0.75 rads per second. Any questions on this one so far? Omega ABC is the, is the angular velocity of the link ABC. See, it's underneath the, the box. So every rigid body will have an angular velocity and a linear velocity associated with it. Not with angular velocity. Angular velocity, it rotates. Think about what it is. It rotates about anything. So in the case of this one, it's not rotating because it has zero velocity. So any angular velocity that I calculate using the relative motion or the absolute fixed point motion is the angular velocity of the body. So in this particular problem, not so much fun because ABC is zero. In the previous 2022 case, I could calculate a number of different locations but always get the same angular velocity. And one of the things that you need to do on your own is go back over the 2022 and 2023 exams and convince yourself of that. Because uh, I had a number of different ways of solving for omega ADE. Omega ADE of the body is going to be different dependent on, or sorry, it's the same, no, independent of how I calculate. So I could calculate it with a vector approach. I could calculate it with angular uh, or with instantaneous centers. I could, and I didn't with graphical methods. <coughs> I think I did a graphical method in the, in the slideshow or on, on the video. All of those will be exactly the same. ABE cannot change. And no matter how I define any point on that body or any arbitrary point, so say I choose a point somewhere else to reference everything to, say the mass center, it will still have an omega ABE that's the same value. That's the one tool that you have that is guaranteed no matter what. Linear velocities, on the other hand, are limited to the point of interest. But linear velocities are the same on every body that is at the same coincident point. So B on one body has the same V sub B as on another. Otherwise, the body would spread apart. So you have to have everything and that consistency in there. Any other questions on that? Okay. 
It's really important to understand this concept. Angular velocities, angular accelerations for a body are all the same, no matter how you do the calculation. You will not get a different angular velocity uh, unless you make a mistake. Um, well. Now again, the other kind of thing that's useful to sort of point out here is that we also kind of looked at different options in terms of, uh, or we have different timings on things. So in the course, for example, we are now covering accelerations. On the exam, we will not cover acceleration because we didn't cover it in time. Last year we did different timings on everything, different start dates. So accelerations, there are lots of different approaches. But they all sort of come down to the same thing. Which is just acceleration B equals acceleration A plus acceleration of B relative to A. And the only problem is that now we deal with rotating systems and we have to solve through for everything. You can do it graphically, don't. It's not worth it. It will drive you crazy. You cannot use an instantaneous center of zero velocity because instantaneous centers of zero velocity don't work with acceleration. So. And what I end up having to do in all of these problems is the same thing, writing my same vector equation, taking all of the terms, and organizing things. When I'm dealing with angular acceleration, angular velocities, or sorry, angular, or sorry, just acceleration generally, I find it, again, is a lot easier to deal with it in this form. Is that is to use the vector approach and say everything is related to the physical geometry of what I'm dealing with. So when I look at normal and tangential components, I'm going to look at radius of A, which is going to be OA. When I'm looking at B, I'm looking at the radius of BB. But BAN and BAT, I'm going to go back and up. And I can immediately see that I'll have a negative X term and a positive Y term of B with respect to A. Now, I could flip it around and solve it for acceleration of A equals acceleration of B plus acceleration of B A with respect to B, in which case it would be a negative J and a positive I. And it's really important that you don't do that in your head. You draw it out. So I can write out acceleration of B N. That is minus DB in the J direction, omega B d squared. And that's coming out of the fact that I have omega cross omega cross r, which I know is a minus omega squared r. And I know that because it's a planar motion where I've constrained motion to the xy plane on all the rotation about k. And when you take robotics in third, fourth year, you don't do that anymore. But the vector solution and the, this approach will work, except for this part. So these become rel relatively easy to write out because you know all the terms, you know what to put in, and you start to just put terms in. The only thing there is that you've got sort of one cross product and one direct multiplication. And 
As a result, normals are going to be in the j direction, which makes sense, and the tangential are normal in the i direction. And everything follows the coordinate system that I've defined. Acceleration e normal is equal to O A omega O A squared, which is equal to zero zero six three squared minus J minus point five four J meters per second. Acceleration A tangential is alpha OA K cross with the same uh, point zero six J, which is equal to negative point six I meters per second squared. So you have everything that you need and you have the correct directions with the vector approach. With scalar approaches, and even to a certain degree the instantaneous centers, which you can't use here, but with scalar approaches, you're going to have to draw them out and make sure you know the direction. I usually can't do that well. Other people do it better than I do. Now, the nice thing is that in this particular case, I know I have translation, translation of the body, and so that uh, results in a zero of the normal acceleration for B with respect to A. And I have everything I need. A, B, A tangential equals alpha A, B. K cross with R, B with respect to A in the I direction. Uh, oh, just R. I'm going to leave it as R. Back there. So I can substitute all the terms in. I've got i, j, and I'll I flip the direct or the numbers in their order. So j i, uh, and I end up with oh, what do we don't know? Uh, I think it's just the alphas. Okay, so substitute all the terms in. You have alpha b b which is equal to 1, 1, 2, 3, 4 uh, rads per second squared. Alpha ooh, AB, which is equal to minus 1.688 rads per second squared. And AB which is equal to 0 0.296 negative i minus 0 0.135 j meters per second squared. So just going back up here for a second, the angular acceleration of the link ABC a is there. And another thing that's really hard to accept is that we sort of say, well, we'll make A, B is zero because we know that this is translating. But this thing is also going through 
and acceleration, which means that if the links, and they will, move over just a tiny bit, I will have an omega of the body, ABC, and uh, this would be a very different problem. But a result of that is that alpha AB can't be zero. Uh, AB point to AB. Questions? It's really important to actually go and draw these diagrams out. Now, to a certain extent, I did badly because I didn't draw out what I was looking at. But if I'm going to do that, ooh, uh, A, B, C, A, B, C, I have that. I have everything relative to A. And I have the links DB. Maybe I can use that. And D with respect to B is R, B with respect to D. And the final link is O and A. And that one, R, O with respect, or A with respect to O. That's another problem I have. Again, both of those will be positive values in my calculation. But if I draw it out, if I show what the coordinate system, which I didn't, x, y, and there, and I put the coordinate system positive, then it's OK. Good. A, a, a body, how can a body have an acceleration if it's not moving? So for example, you often have impulses that occur. So if you look at one of the older questions, you had two masses that were connected to a rod. At the instant that you were looking at it, it had a velocity of zero, but a ex non-zero acceleration. It's the same thing here. This thing is now rotating. The arms are rotating through there. And at the next instant, the next delta theta, you will see an omega with there, and you will see a new alpha. It has to have an acceleration, otherwise it wouldn't move. Exactly. So this is in the process of movement. And often, we do try to make things a little bit easier when solving these problems. We understand it's hard to visualize these things. But the real trick with all of this is to, one, accept that as you're going through these types of problems, you've got to draw it. Don't just take a look at the problem and say, hey, that makes sense, and I can sort of follow what they've done. There's a lot of uh, uh, pre-done problems. This one's or the other one's. Uh, I have a whole bunch of old midterms from 2020 that I printed because of COVID, but we didn't use because of COVID. Um, but there's lots of options there in terms of looking at things. Do the problems. Draw the problems. Make sure that you are confident that you have everything that you're supposed to have. Any other questions? I think there's a rush on this room. Go ahead. Its angular velocity will be the same. So the question was, the rigid body, the angular velocity, the angular acceleration will always be the same. I'll see you twice tomorrow. Have a good day.